Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of The Probe. And the big question on our minds tonight is whether democracy is receding in West Africa. Some countries in the sub-region are witnessing military takeovers. At an emergency meeting last Friday here in Ghana, the ECOWAS heads of states and then the President Ekofado, who leads it, described the latest coup in Burkina Faso as a threat to the stability and peace of the region. So the siege on President Kabori's administration adds up to similar turmoil in Mali and Guinea, not to talk about the increasing terrorist activities on the sub-region. There are fears that the trend could complicate the already delicate security of West African states. So what exactly are the factors accounting for this and what is the likely impact on the sub-region and how do we move on from here? What are the key learnings especially for us as a country, a country Ghana? That and more are the issues on the probing table tonight. Your questions, as always, are welcome. And my guest, Ambassador William Awinado Kanyarigi, former ambassador to Nigeria and ECOWAS, and subsequently Ethiopia and AU. He's also the former chief of staff for ECOWAS. He's my guest. Levinia Adaimensa, programs director at the West African Network for Peace Building, WANEP. I also have Mutaru Mumuni Mukhtar. He's the executive director of the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism. He's on tonight. I have Omolara Balogun, Head Policy Influence and Advocacy Unit, West Africa Civil Society Institute. It's a packed show and it's time to learn about what we can do moving forward in terms of the military takeovers and terrorism. That and more in tonight's edition of The Probe. We are live on the Joy News channel. We're also live on myjoyonline.com, DSTV channel 421, GoTV 144, and all our social media platforms. It's a good time to send your questions in if you haven't done so already. A quick turnaround and we get talking. I am MFA Apau, and as always, this is your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. Please stay. Welcome back, and it's a good time to start talking. And I've already uh, told you about my guest. If you missed it, I have Ambassador William Awinado Kanyarigi. He is a former ambassador to Nigeria and ECOWAS, and subsequently he was in Ethiopia and also AU. is a former chief of staff for ECOWAS. I also have Levinia Adaimensa. She's a programs director for West Africa Network for Peace Building. I also have Mutaru Mumuni Mukta, executive director of uh, the West Africa Center for Counterterrorism, and also Omolara. Balogun, uh, she's the head policy influence and advocacy unit, West Africa Civil Society Institute. You're welcome to tonight's edition of the probe. Um, I would want to start uh, with the ladies, of course. Um, I, the concern uh, for many is whether the sub region can be best be described as unstable as we have it. And uh, maybe we should start with Omolara, that since you do the policy influence and advocacy unit, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again. Uh, if you can all hear me, maybe we should just um, start with uh, Omolara on this. Uh, can we best describe the sub-region as unstable? Thank you so much uh, for having me. I think that would be perfect if we use that terms at this time because what we have experienced in the past 18 months is not only worrisome, it's something that is troubling to, do, to our, our political elites, citizens, and even our international partners. We have seen, uh, uh, we're continuing to see a trend that we thought we have left behind for so many years. We've done a lot of work around consolidating democracy. We've had several elections across the region. Of course, some, some of them are not perfect, but what we have witnessed in the past three months really dictates that concept of instability, especially considering the security situations that we have in the Sahel and the different activities of the jihadists that we are all trying to collectively battle within the region. I think at this point, uh, uh, th there is a lot of insecurity going on and instability, if not attended to almost immediately, could actually consume the region at this point. Uh, because y y you see, when we look at the state of our democracy, uh, I think it it's perfect to say it's declining quite faster than we built it. You know, and uh, when, when you look at the, the rate at which our citizens have supported some of the goods that we are seeing, I think for me, that is what is most worrisome in the sense that the people can now be looking at military uh, uh, folks to rescue us from democratic coup 
as we can describe the, the failures of, of some of our democ democratic leaders. So I think it will, it's not far-fetched if we use, we, we use that concept of instability, and it's growing very fast. It requires immediate attention. Well, Lavinia, so you heard Omolora, um, it goes without saying for her that it can best be described that there's some kind of instability uh, in the sub-region. You've been looking at um, networking and peace building. From what we're seeing, looking at the trend over the period, what exactly would you say could be accounting for the situation that we are witnessing? Well, thank you very much and good evening to everyone. I think um, we, what we are living now is clearly, you know, um, a manifestation of a cascade of a crisis that have been ongoing for a while, particularly at governance you know, levels. And when I say governance, it's really all forms of governance. But of course, uh, what is more concerning is the political governance fragilities that we have been witnessing across the region, uh, which has led to a lot of uh, social and economic hardships among citizens. And so we are seeing um, citizens of West Africa now beginning to raise critical questions and the days where you know the scorecard for democracy was based on free and fair elections, I think you know there's been a major shift away from that to beginning to look at the quality of uh, democracy. And it's not just about you know winning elections; it's more about what have we gained as citizens in terms of human security. How are we our needs being addressed? And I think um, the sort of uh, uprisings we have seen, which are now manifesting in you know some countries um, having military, you know, take advantage of the situation to, to seize power. I think it's, 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 it's clearly a manifestation of these crises that we have been living, you know, over the years. Mm. But, um, Mutaro, I don't know what you think. Is it that our intelligence is not as woke, some would say, as it ought to be? What could really be the case? Is it that we may have let our guard down at some point such that we're witnessing what we are witnessing. I'm told that I don't have uh, Mutaro uh, yet uh, on the phone, uh, on, via Zoom. I've just lost him. But it's a good time also to bring in uh, Ambassador William Awinado Kanyarigi because um, you have um, seen it all. At least um, you've been working with ECOWAS. You were the former chief of staff. I would want to f find out from you, from where you sit or stand, what's your key reading of exactly what we are witnessing especially in the sub-region. Thank you very much, MF, and good evening to our viewers and listeners. Uh, and I would also like to congratulate you for the gender balance um, in the panel. Uh, and I hope uh, you maintain that uh, we need that, especially in relation to the topics that we are going to be discussing. Um, my take is this, that uh, we need to situate it in addition, of course, to what my uh, co-panelists have said. By the way, they are colleagues, are professional colleagues. I work with them very closely. Uh, so thank you for bringing me on the same panel with them. Uh, to situate it within uh, the global context, uh, the continental and regional, and also the trajectories that our individual countries go through, which also brings about certain peculiarities. And so that we're not to generalize uh, whether it's to do with the region or the continent or uh, the world, because there are individual country experiences. In Ghana, for instance, we've gone through our own, and in the process of going through our own, we've become a model for quite a number of countries I mean, to follow, even though we still have quite some work to do. Uh, on the global uh, uh, level, uh, first of all, as was mentioned, this, there's a, a disillusionment um, and the quality of governance globally, and not just in Africa. And I think we need to uh, factor that in. As it relates to democracy itself, uh, it becomes more telling, even in the case of Africa, that uh, more and more our citizens are asking the question whether democracy is actually delivering development. And uh, that issue has been in discussion for some time now. I know CDD Ghana, for instance, uh, about a year or two ago, in collaboration with the African Union and ECOWAS, uh, was uh, launching a study on the state of democracy in Africa in order to try and bring out the answers I mean, to these questions. For some reason, it appears to have stalled. Um, so. Uh, and so uh, in Africa in particular, we really need to unpack 
what democracy really is. I mean, otherwise, as we understand it and as we are practicing it, it looks like we are going to have challenges moving forward. And you can see some of it. Well, what, what exactly about what we are practicing currently is going to make us yeah, see the challenges you. that we, you're talking about? Exactly. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, because of our colonial experience and education, we tend to be driven by this liberal uh, uh, ideology in our conceptualization of almost everything. Mm -hmm. Whether it's to do with uh, the different ideologies of capitalism or socialism, or it's to do with even development that top-down approach, um, which we have tried to correct in terms of our governance structure in the case of Ghana, three-tier, national, regional, and local, where the local should be the main focus. Because anything that happens, and we feel nationally or regionally or continentally or globally, is from a particular local area, and therefore to prioritize some of that. But this tendency of approaching things top-down um, even by public servants when we are doing policy making or um, recommendations to our forces. So that when you are uh, uh, discussing decentralization and local government, I mean, we claw back to the center in the process. And so we tend to be moving in circles in that case. So we need to get out of that uh, 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 mindset and look at other best practices. And that is why if you see countries like Rwanda in Africa, China I mean, in Asia, I mean, you can see that there are other narratives which we can look at in addition to our own African heritage. Because of, the, because of this historical hiatus, thanks to the colonial experience, we seem to have forgotten that we are the cradle of global civilization. And so our educated elite need to be up and doing that what we are practicing is not delivering. And so the question is, is it our understanding of it? Is it that we are doing cut and paste? Or is it a certain complex which makes us to look outward and not even recognize when good things are happening nationally and in ECOWAS and in African Union, and that only good, uh, good things only come from outside? Mm. Then uh, in relation to that also, if you look at it uh, globally, climate change is also a driver. And as it relates to Africa, if you look at the Sahel region, which is under serious threat now, and you look at the desert conditions and how people are trying to eke out a living almost out of nothing, that leads to other things. There, there are open spaces there where governance is not reaching them. They don't even have a police I mean, a protection. And so you create an open space where criminals are ready to take advantage of I mean, uh, uh, and do whatever they have to do in that case. Then the youth bulge. If you look at the youth bulge, Africa has a huge potential of an energy that is about to come out and roar. But we, because we are not strategic, that energy can turn out to be uh, negative energy. And so we need to manage that by making sure that we take advantage of the Millennium Development Goals um, uh, achievements into the sustainable development goals to ensure access to education and not just access but also quality education because you cannot talk about access whereby the access is uh, opened up but the quality is restricted to an urbanized I mean, uh, privileged I mean, group. That is another recipe for disaster. That as some people say, if you don't educate people, those who are being privileged you will not be sleeping at night, mind you. And so, and then the global dynamics, if you look at what happened uh, in Libya and what it unleashed onto our region, particularly the Sahel up to the home, that is also another challenge that we are facing, which also imposes a certain responsibility on the global community to help address the situation of insecurity uh, in the Sahel and across I mean, uh, the, I mean, the Sahel. Okay. Then the national trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, we, we cannot generalize. I mean, Ghana went through a certain experience. And that experience, as I said, has even become a model whereby some countries want to follow our example. So we moved ahead. And then others are now going through that. You cannot force them to um, move ahead, but you can help them 
to avoid the mistakes we made, that uh, so, some of which are still I mean, uh, challenging us. So these are some of the perspectives I wanted to add okay. to what my two colleagues um, uh, 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 nicely put I, I have a hours. number of um, audience questions um, that raises uh, issues about um, the impact of ECOWAS, for instance, and the interventions in situations like this, and of course the key learnings uh, for Ghana as well, because um, it appears that the rising tensions, at least what we've seen in Burkina Faso, we have seen some rising tensions in Togo. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is also having its own issue, and Ghana is more like in that uh, triangle between all that melee and what exactly we can be doing to safeguard our borders as a country as well. But let me bring in quickly, Mutari, uh, for your also, uh, your opening remarks on this, then we can get into the audience questions as well. You've seen the interventions uh, from ECOWAS, for instance, at least. Uh, they've mentioned how it's going to impact on us and hoping that some key things will be done uh, by those who are taking over uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, no, Burkina Faso, for instance. For you... Uh, do you think that beyond just issuing communiques and threats by ECOWAS, they've really made the impact as they ought to? Mutaro? You would have to unmute, Mutaro. Well, well, good evening and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak on this very, very important matter. Uh, we've seen ECOWAS act in this same way in previous circumstances, resorting to the very, very traditional tools of suspensions and things like that. You know, these things are very traditional and they have proven very, very ineffective in terms of the, its capacity to get these military leaders back on the path of democracy or civilian rule. And so, if OCOS is repeating saying, I do not expect to see anything different in terms of outcomes. I think that overall, uh, we are tackling the problem the wrong way. Uh, the descent, you know, the issue of violent extremism from the Sahel, descending towards coastal states, has been a reality for more than five years. And so these are things we should have, you know, uh, been very, very proactive in terms of dealing with the drivers and the underpinnings of these factors in terms of the terrorist violence that has led to what Mali is today. And it's the same situation with Burkina Faso. And if you look at the issue of, and I've listened to my previous speakers speaking very appropriately in terms of the challenges that the Sahel, as well as the coastal states of West Africa are facing. The issue of governance. Governance is a very, very big problem, coupled with issues of you know, youth unemployment. The huge governance deficit coupled with youth unemployment makes this country and this leadership is very, very fragile. And so things like this happening should not surprise anyone who's been watching all this while. I think my general summary in terms of the challenge we're dealing with is that what we are seeing in terms of violent extremism and in terms of the coups that are happening is largely a product or a manifestation, you know, of the frustrations, the anger of citizens who have lost faith in their states and in their leaders' capacity to provide them or guarantee them what I call the entitlements of citizenship. If you look at the huge problem of youth unemployment, it's a huge feature. If you follow incidents before the first coup happened in 2020, it tells you, you know, this is an environment that has huge issues of youth unemployment. And mind you, all these three countries combined, it's about, you know, uh, 45 to 50 million people from the age of 20, 22. And so these are people you need to be able to, you know, address their concerns, their challenges of unemployment, job creation, and other, you know, amenities relating to, you know, specifically water, healthcare, education, and things like that. We see that play out in Guinea. And we see that play out in Burkina Faso. I was in Burkina Faso a couple of months back on some counterterrorism mission. And it was clear, if you looked at, you know, on the ground, the challenges of deficit in terms of governance and young people's frustration and a sense of marginalization with existing leadership. These are pointers to whoever was in charge. That's something that has, I mean, this that has just happened 
was a likely situation. And so I think these are things that are not and should not be surprising to all of us. And the way ECOWAS chooses to respond to those has been very, very dysfunctional. And I think that it's, it's high time ECOWAS and all stakeholders agreed that ECOWAS is not properly and effectively tooled to deal with the challenges of these current times. Mm. If you remember, the, I mean, the Lagos Protocol that established um, ECOWAS in 1975 did not originally, you know, a part of the world of ECOWAS. It was an afterthought, and of course, a product of the reality of coups and external aggression on countries within the West African region. So we need to be very realistic. The challenges we're dealing with right now are quite different from the past. Okay. And ECOWAS hasn't been able to keep up in mm. terms of reforming to deal with it. Okay. Well, I, I, would, I would love to hear uh, the others also on this um, ECOWAS and uh, the sanctions, uh, the, the things they do when such incidents occur, but it, it appears that nothing much uh, comes out of it. And then also the key learnings. But it's a good time to bring in the audience questions as well, because it's also, I know that uh, there are questions on that as well. So maybe it's a good time to bring in the first batch of audience questions, then we can uh, get answers to it. Seydou is saying, is ECOWAS losing credibility among citizens in the sub-region? That's the very first question from Seydou. Uh, we have Aban. He says it's been the fourth coup in the region in less than two years. What may be accounting for these military takeovers and how many more may still be in the offing? We'll take another one. Seku is saying all the coups reported so far have come in uh, French-speaking West African countries. Theories are rife that there may be the influence on French in all these. How serious can such claims be? Seku is asking. And Nabiatu says, what role can ECOWAS play beyond sanctioning these countries and suspending them? So maybe we take uh, responses uh, to these uh, questions and then uh, we, can, we can take uh, the next batch, at, at least. Uh, it raises the issues about ECOWAS in there. Amolara, maybe you can start this turn as well. Uh, Seku is raising concerns about whether ECOWAS is losing credibility among citizens in the sub-region. Maybe we can box in Nabiatu's question also, the role ECOWAS can play beyond sanctioning these countries and suspending them. It appears that it's, it's not working. Oh, thank you so much. I think that is a growing perception that uh, ECOWAS is losing credibility. But it's also important for us to understand the context in which ECOWAS is operating. ECOWAS has commitments to protect, uh, 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 to act in accordance with its provisions, its protocols uh, on good governance and, and, and democracy, which we have all, you know, uh, collectively labored for together. And where a coup occurs, like we have seen in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, uh, ECOWAS has acted in, in, in right manner, if you ask me, according to its text according to its, uh, 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 its protocols and its own ambitions of having a democratic and progressive you know, region. However, when we look at the sanctions, uh, and I love, I, I love the way my colleague uh, uh, Mutaru already puts it, that can we do more than sanctions? Uh, I've read a lot of articles and I've been on other platforms where we have had opportunity to discuss the ECOWAS sanction, especially uh, the very strict uh, a second leg of sanctions that, that was uh, uh, meted on, on Mali. The point is, uh, uh, when a country is sanctioned, unless it is well targeted at the military leaders, then every citizen on, I mean, every citizen on the street of that country will feel the ripple effect of these sanctions. Now, let's look at the region we are talking about. This is a region, like Ambassador put this very rightly, and, and my other colleagues, it's a region that has very long history of security crisis, which we all collectively have been trying to, you know, to, to respond to. The crisis of terrorism is not limited to a particular country. It's a global threat that we are all trying to find, you know, you know, uh, 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 um, right answers to. This is a country where the Mali, for example, is a landlocked country. It's a country where the assets that we living in the coastal countries have, they do not have it. At the same time, if you look at the location of Mali, it's 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 very critical to entire situation in the Sahel. 
Now, with the different sanctions that ECOWAS has built out, it's, I'm re it's really exciting to read that uh, they are yet to, to read out sanctions for, for Burkina. I don't know what will happen in the meeting they are planning to hold next week. But of course, you have people who are currently suffering, you know, you, people living under serious abject poverty. You have rising inequality. You have unemployment. You have climate change especially in the Sahel, which, which uh, Ambassador had mentioned. These are the conditions in which the people in that region have been battling with way before COVID happened and way before they could happen. And interestingly, when you look at some of the comments that the Junta themselves have made to justify this nefarious act, is the fact that they themselves as military do not have access to right welfare, mm -hmm. basic welfare, nor do they have access to the right machineries, you know, to fight the jihadists. So they keep losing their men and their own life is also under serious threat, coupled with that of the country, you know, the populace they are supposed to protect. So to me, I think it's, it, 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 it's, uh, it's a kind of, you know, grief and grievances, somebody responding to, to, to uh, 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 bad governance, you know, lack, lack of safety net for the military and for the citizens. So coming up with additional uh, uh, you know, sanction or sanctions that would lead very well, which we have seen in Mali, to massive humanitarian crisis is something I have reservation for. And of course, when we look at some of the uh, economic sanctions, this is something that is going to affect an average man on the street of, 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 of Bamako and, and all of that. And it also makes it difficult for people who are to offer humanitarian services, you know, to offer it at the right time, if not okay. even more costly than, than it's supposed to be. So I think it's important, like Mutaru said, that ECOWAS relook some of these strategies. I think for me, at this point, it is clear while some of the fundamental factors that brought us here in the first place were uh, unattended to. Because I remember, prior to the very first school in Mali, mm -hmm. many Malians, millions of Malians were marching on the street almost every, on every Friday, if I remember clearly. ECOWAS didn't say anything at that time. At least, I mean, if they did, we didn't hear about it. Okay, so when we look away from people, when they are responding to bad governance in their own way, then it is difficult for us or for ECOWAS as an institution to just come up with sanctions against the same people. And okay. then let me take you quickly back to ECOWAS protocol, especially the Vision 2020 we just expired and it's been transformed to Vision 2050. It talks about people-centeredness moving from ECOWAS of head of state to ECOWAS of people. So I think whatever response we are, we are providing to this situation, be it from international community, from ECOWAS as an institution, from development partners, it has to prioritize the people. Okay. So I don't think sanctions is, 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 is doing that. I don't, okay. I don't think so. Okay, I'm hoping we so. can we take as many, different. I'm hoping we can take as many questions as possible. I know we have a lot uh, on this, but um, Nabia too uh, also raises, okay, so uh, Levina, maybe I'll come to you on that as well. Maybe you can touch briefly on the issues about the ECOWAS sanctions, but I see a question. Seku raises the issue about the foreign influence also in this, he mentions uh, issues about the French-speaking African countries experiencing what we are seeing and also asking about the, how serious the claim uh, could be about uh, France, for instance. Now we're also hearing about Russian influence, amongst others, uh, in this that we are seeing. Maybe briefly, uh, ECOWAS issues and then the foreign influence. If you can box them together, then we can hear uh, from Ambassador and then Mutari also on that. Then we can take another batch of questions. Right. Um, I think there's no doubt there are critical questions to ask about ECOWAS and um, ECOWAS's role in addressing some of the crises we, we're facing now. Um, at the risk of sounding you know, defensive in favor of ECOWAS, I think it's important to recognize that ECOWAS has a very difficult task at hand. Um, I, but I think it's important that it continues to show leadership, um, which is what ECOWAS is trying to do at this moment. Um, of course, what are the approaches they are using? Are they the right ones? We can continue to interrogate them. Uh, but as I said, uh, given the history of foreign interventions in West Africa, I think more than ever, this is the time that ECOWAS ne really needs to show that leadership. And I think they are making those efforts. Let's not forget, before we got to sanctions, there was a, you know, a, a couple of 
you know, initiatives that had been taken by ECOWAS, including efforts at mediation, efforts at negotiation, preventive diplomacy, you name them. And um, it took a while to get to where we are now. Again, um, the concerns that are being raised are very legitimate in terms of uh, how ECOWAS has, you know, um, uh, activated the sanctions regime. And I think, unfortunately, ECOWAS is caught in a crisis of credibility and uh, a discourse of legitimacy also um, following a chain of what is perceived as trial missed opportunities, some of which Omolara talked about, you know, when the citizens were in arms against issues of elongation of term limits and so on, where was ECOWAS? So there are legitimate questions that are being asked. Mm. Um, so now we have a situation where activating a sanctions regime in Mali for, um, is being criticized, you know, with some critics calling it into question issues of morality of the authority of heads of state. Again, if you just oppose that against uh, the ECOWAS vision 2050 again, which Omolara referred to. Um, but although others also have gone for as far as, you know, raising issues of uh, illegality, even with aspects of the, of the sanctions. So definitely there is something to look into that. But I think for me, what we need to focus on um, is also, or what we choose to focus on is also what are the lessons that you know, the situation in Mali, in Guinea, and Burkina Faso presents us to begin to also interrogate some of the approaches that have been used in the past. And here you talked about, for instance, French involvement. So there are questions around what have the uh, strategies that, you know, have been used by these multinational emissions uh, forces uh, all these years. Uh, what have they led to? Um, were they really to, you know, um, in favor of the people of these countries, or was it more of you know, um, geopolitical interest? Um, so um, there are a number of uh, questions to raise around that. And I think um, the recent developments in all these countries uh, tell us that we need a clear shift you know, from the, the hardcore military approaches that have been used in the past to address issues of, of violent extremism, you know, the whole counter-terrorism strategies that have invested huge amounts of money into hardcore security rather than investing in you know, uh, building resilience of local communities and having more inclusive processes that allows for local ownership and leadership of these processes. And I think that's where we really need to ask ourselves. And now we see more uh, powers, you know, foreign powers coming in. Now Russia has entered you know, the scene. I mean, Russia was always in the background, but now it's front and center. Um, in uh, Mali and in Burkina Faso. Uh, and so there are questions about what are the geopolitics that are also going to now emerge or even become even more uh, uh, derogatory for the region uh, as we see the various interests manifesting around uh, the, the issues that we are facing as a region. Mm. Well, we have the former chief of staff of ECOWAS uh, with us, uh, thankfully. And uh, Ambassador, you've heard uh, the, the concerns, issues about credibility rising uh, when it comes to ECOWAS and its uh, interventions in what we're seeing in the sub-region. Uh, what really is the situation? Is ECOWAS losing that credibility? And why have the sanctions, at least, not deterred others uh, from engaging in similar acts? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I think uh, in terms of perception, there is a real challenge of credibility of ECOWAS, particularly in our region, West Africa. Uh, what, as you start moving out of the region, uh, the real picture of ECOWAS comes into play as uh, not just one of the leading wrecks in Africa, but one of the leading wrecks in the world. ECOWAS is a model. And like my preceding uh, uh, speaker uh, 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 tried to bring it up, I think we need to look at it in this way. Where has ECOWAS come from? Where is it standing now? And where is it going? When you do that, then you realize that the cup is half full and definitely not half empty. In uh, uh, 1990, when ECOWAS deployed ECOMOC, it became a precursor of what today we call responsibility to protect. That when there is fire in your neighbor's house, you don't sit down and uh, use uh, legal reasons of uh, national sovereignty, but you go in and help them as brethren. 
At that time, ECOWAS was criticized for that deployment. Today, on hindsight, ECOMOC is the precursor of the uh, UN concept of responsibility to protect. Out of that Liberian intervention, ECOWAS did the kind of study that our brother um, uh, Mustafa said, looking at the underlying factors, and realized that we needed to build permanent mechanisms. So as a first step, we produced the 1999 protocol, which created the ECOWAS Mediation Security Council, which has served as a model for the African Union, although the African Union Peace and Security Council appears to be working much better than the ECOWAS one for reasons that we can go into later. ECOWAS didn't stop there. It came out with the additional protocol on democracy and good governance. And when you read that, I mean, there is a challenge for member states to do constitutional convergence of good governance. The problem is that we have not implemented, and that is the responsibility of the member states. And that responsibility is shared between the state institutions and non-state actors, civil society as well. At the regional level, ECOWAS supported CSOs to create a regional platform of CSOs called WAXO, West African Civil Society Forum. It started on the wrong footing, wobbled, virtually collapsed, and with the help of some CSOs, it's being uh, revived, but still with a challenge. More recently, ECOWAS tried to create, uh, develop a strategy of engagement with CSOs. And uh, Omolara is very much, I mean, the picture, I mean, uh, uh, organization WAXI played a, a lead role, but ECOWAS ran into a problem mm -hmm. with CSO, not uh, with state side, with CSO. So the responsibility is shared. What I see that is happening is this, that we are not showing much interest as citizens, ECOWAS citizens and as CSOs in what is happening within the ECOWAS space. Two, those of us in the so-called English speaking space, we are, because of uh, linguistic challenges, we are not even following what is happening in our next door neighbors space. Mm. A lot has been going on in the Francophone space. They have a, and I'm taking it uh, uh, to the second question about foreign um, uh, interference. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, in international relations, there is no state that is immune from external influences. How you minimize that is how strategic you are in terms of your governance and foreign policy and how consistent I mean, you are. In that francophone space, the privileged relations they had with the former metropolis is coming under stress because of the normal uh, uh, relationship between the ruled and uh, the rulers in every country. It's going through a natural trajectory, and that has been happening. Parallel to that, we have all these security challenges unleashed on us internally and externally as well. So there are two parallel developments, and at some point, there could be crisscrossing. And that is why some people find it easy to say, oh, it's because of the external factor. But there are two parallel uh, developments, and there could be Chris Costa. Okay. So let's look at the larger picture, I mean, here, that there is something happening in the world, there is something happening in Africa, and that change is coming. How to manage that change is the problem. So mm. ECOWAS cup is half full, but the responsibility to fill it is not on the state alone, but on the state and the non-state actors. Okay. We well, must ensure that the protocols are implemented. Okay. Well, we so, must in ensuring that these protocols are implemented. For instance, we're here mm -hmm. and we're seeing mm -hmm. extension of term limits. Uh, for instance, we're witnessing a situation like that in La Côte d'Ivoire, and it appears mm -hmm. nothing much is being done about it. Then we wait. There is a coup, then sanctions are now uh, meted out to these countries. How then do we sit and wait for that to happen? Term limits is a key concern across Africa. Yeah, we, we, I'm happy you said we. The, where the we is not <laughs> the state institutions, but the state and the non-state. Um, ECOWAS in 2015 was supposed to adopt um, a, a decision on term limitation here in Accra, 2015, Accra National Conference Center. One was very key 
in working with ECOWAS to get there. The decision um, collapsed here in Accra. The question I keep asking myself is, what has the CSO space done to make sure that that has been brought back? Because this is 2015, and we are in what, 2021. L Lavinia is here with us. Lavinia, how come it hasn't been brought back? Is it because those who are supposed to take the decision are the ones who are enjoying the power, so they would not want their term limits to be reduced? Well, um, let, me, let me start it off first from where Ambassador left off about the case of civil society. I think um, it's important to recognize, yes, as he rightly said, um, civil society, uh, particularly civil society organizations who stand in the gap and claim to, you know, fight for um, the, um, uh, you know, the, the lesser voices, I think have that responsibility to ensure that some of these governance issues are well addressed. And indeed, um, in November of um, 2021, again, following um, ECOWAS's own decision uh, by the Authority of Heads of State mm -hmm. for a review of the protocols relating to democracy and good governance, as civil society, we got together a number of critical civil society organizations, again, to help that process, to support that process by proposing some considerable level of uh, changes that could be considered. Unfortunately, at the summit in December, you know, that those were those uh, recommendations were not taken up. So, um, yes, civil society continues to follow that. However, you know, the structure of ECOWAS that the ambassador spoke about in itself, it, in some instances, limits the extent to which civil society is able to be um, effective in providing the support that is expected of it. Um, a lot of, you know, power lies in the hands of the authority, the heads of state, and as they are called, the authority. So a lot of things are decided at that level. So mm -hmm. civil society can come up with different things, and it doesn't happen. However, the opportunity we have at national level is how well we are engaging with national institutions, again, that mm -hmm. were referred to, the state institutions that refer to. And it's important that in that engagement between civil society and state institutions, there is that recognition of, you know, um, uh, um, of, of something that civil society can bring to the table rather than just, you know, be critical and activist. It's important that civil society provides that needed support to fill the gaps that state institutions are not able to. So that partnership, the formation of that partnership is critical. Okay. You know, there has to be that relationship that allows for civil society to have a space and a voice to operate, operate at national level. At the supranational level, we have challenges because of the organization of the organs of ECOWAS. But I think at state level, we do have some opportunities there. And indeed, there are civil society groups that are taking these up. And so I think it's important to recognize that those efforts. Um, nonetheless, I do agree that there's still a lot to be done and we need to look at this. Uh, and we continue to learn from opportunities of what these crises that we are facing. And so it's important to continue to open the lines of communication, the dialogue uh, platforms to allow us to share and begin to see what the way forward is. It's important to criticize and point out where the mistakes are. Okay. But what is more important is to be able to provide options for consideration. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than just criticize. Mm. Well, uh, Ghana happens to be uh, the only um, Anglophone country in this whole triangle uh, that uh, we've been talking about. Burkina Faso experiencing their own. There's some kind of rising tension also in Togo. And then uh, La Côte d'Ivoire also. Uh, the key concern, at least, what we should be also focusing on, from what I've heard all of you say, how Ghana can also, um, the key learnings for us as a country, and also safeguarding our uh, borders amongst others uh, to prevent any such uh, situation, I would say, knock on wood. But um, I'll take uh, the final batch of questions from the audience, then we can dedicate the rest of the time for it, um, and then take a look at the key learnings for us as a country. Uh, so if we're ready, let's uh, take uh, the, f the second batch of questions. And what is the peculiar story of Burkina Faso when the president is not known to have overstayed his term limit like others had? That's uh, Sophie's question. Lisa says, what is the role of a lack of economic opportunities, youth unrest, organized crimes, endemic corruption, and more spending on military armament than public spending for basic services in these military takeovers? Lisa's question. Uh, 
And Lukman says, what will be the relation of government that has not been overthrown yet? I wonder what other leaders will be feeling and how they will relate to the armed forces. Lukman. Dapila says, why are coups pervasive in the West African region despite ECOWAS' imposition of sanctions on the affected countries? We have more. Ebenezer says, has ECOWAS largely ignored the actions of certain presidents that might not be in tune with the needs and aspirations of their citizenry and only reacted when there's an unconstitutional change of government by swiftly imposing sanctions? So uh, more uh, on that. Okay, Haruna uh, says... Is there a one-size-fits-all solution to this big issue? And what role can the ECOWAS, the AU, other regional bodies and citizens play to make the sub-region more democratic and coups less perverse, uh, pervasive, I should say? So maybe um, a number of the questions, we can't go through all of them, but it looks like one thing runs through it. Um, so uh, Mutaru, I don't know if I have Mutaru back. We lost him along the line. Okay, so I have Mutaru. Uh, should we be expecting more of such coups that we are seeing uh, in the sub-region from what we have witnessed so far. We've just entered 2022. We've started with one. From where you sit, you think there will be more? Well, how, what can we be doing to avert it? Well, uh, we've been told to be careful about prophesying or predictions <laughs> and predictions of gloom. Uh, I think that before the, the year ended, many people had <laughs> you know, uh, predicted that we would have more coups after Mali, we would have more coups before the end of the year. And of course, before the end of the year, we did have when New Year, we are greeted with a new coup. Um, the pervasive factors and vulnerabilities that lead these countries to this point are still very present in some of the West African countries. And so I would not be very surprised at all. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we do have, you know, some more uh, coup in the region. We, of course, I saw some of the comments or questions talking about Burkina Faso, asking what is the state of the president? What is the story? Why did it happen in Burkina Faso? Because he was just, you know, um, about a year away from his time, his tenure of office. Guinea was the, was the story, a story of a president who extended his stay in office, uh, what some describe as constitutional coup. But in Mali, in Burkina Faso, and in several other parts within the region, we still have pervasive vulnerabilities, the challenges of extremism, and the factors that could lead individuals to engage in violent extremism. Our northern border here it is in a very, very vulnerable state. And we keep repeating it because we want to avoid any eventuality. And it's important that we look at the entire sub-region. Look, um, five years ago, we knew that the threat in the Sahel region is not just staying within the Sahel. Uh, we came from a peak of over 7,200 fatalities in 2014. And while the numbers have come down, the threat has become more complex and more pervasive in areas that did not have this challenge. And what we're seeing, the trajectory, mm -hmm. is moving towards coastal states. And so that's why, beyond Burkina Faso, we're seeing the northern part of Cote d'Ivoire experiencing attacks. We're seeing the northern part of, you know, Togo having the same things, and Benin in a very vulnerable situation. And so these things are vulnerabilities we have to look at. An important point I want to make is, uh, look, in many parts of the region, extremists, recruiters understood or understand young people or the youth better than the state. And extremists have a very, very big exploitative capacity. And so they fill the void left by the state. And we saw that in Chad, we saw that in Northern Burkina Faso and in Mali. And so it is important for us to pay attention to governance deficit. And in areas where the state is absent, extremists would occupy it. And these things are critical in terms of ensuring the stability we're talking about. Okay. Uh, Levina talked about you know, investing or focusing more on security. Mm -hmm. And it's true. My analysis has always been that our response to the problems of West Africa, including the security problems, have been over-securitized. Over-securitization of the solutions has led to neglect of the drivers of the problems we're dealing with the pervasive issues of youth unemployment, 
Investing long term in job creation and, in, and youth is an important feature of this region, okay. which we well, should not and cannot ignore one long term stability. Okay, Mutaru, I need to do that quick round because uh, we are, I can see that um, I'm enjoying it, but our time is um, fast spent. But, Ambassador, so let's look at Ghana and the key learnings for us, at least uh, the issues that we've all raised. And maybe we should bring it back home so that we can all, uh, you know, learn from the situations that we're witnessing elsewhere. What would you say should be the key learnings for us as a country? Anglophone, you've talked about how we don't really uh, care about what goes on in the Francophone countries, but we care now. What can we be doing? What should we be looking at? What are the key indicators? Yeah, yeah thank you very much. If uh, you watch the video of our president in his opening remarks at the last ECOWAS summit, uh, he did indicate that uh, um, no one is immune. But of course, depending on the trajectory of your country, you are less immune than others. And uh, given our African solidarity, we need to support each other in order to um, uh, minimize um, the uh, challenge. For me, what is the key lesson here is that uh, governance and the quality of governance is very key in determining whether we are going to have more insecurity or less insecurity. So uh, uh, the first lesson that I think we should have is what um, uh, a key military officer retired now was staying at a seminar. That uh, in Ghana, it doesn't look like security awareness is one of our, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, advantages. We take security too much for granted. And earlier on, the uh, um, our colleague, uh, speaker, Mrs. Mensa, talked about human security. So we need to unpack security, and especially we need to unpack human security in order to inform the kind of governance and security governance that we will practice. And I had the privilege of attending a Catholic Secretariat Caritas uh, seminar on integral human development where I think they unpack human security very well. And it's, it, it, uh, it's in this way, that the human being is four-dimensional. You are first a spirit before you are flesh. And therefore, you have a spiritual part, you have a mental part, you have a physical part, and you have an emotional part. And addressing all these four uh, gives you the totality of human security you need. So you, we must develop spiritual intelligence, if you look at the nature of our religiosity in Ghana and the rest of Africa, I, mean, um, I think it's, uh, the manifestation or the practice is more subversive to our development than in development enhancing. We must develop the mind as well. The educational content and pedagogy, which comes from the colonial experience that we are still holding on to, I mean, so hard, I mean, that, it baffles me. That also needs to be addressed right from childhood, including peace education, including educating the children on human rights, uh, basic human rights. If you look at some of the countries that are making it, like the Scandinavian, even the US, right from early stages, the children are exposed to uh, peace education, human rights, uh, including the respect of the national flag, the national anthem, uh, and things like that. Uh, and so for me, uh, the last point I want to make is in relation to what uh, uh, Mr. Diamond also mentioned. There is an entry point for non-state actors in terms of engaging with the state side, mm. which does well, but also has slippages. And like she said, you need to cover it. The CSO side also has a, a, a lot of contribution that it's been making and continues to make, but it also has slippages. And together, let's enhance the strengths and minimize the weaknesses. But so my advice is mm -hmm. use the member state level as entry point first, not the regional. The uh, ECOWAS has a framework which compels member states to create national committees for integration, which is supposed to be state institutions and non-state. It is clearly spelled out. Media, I mean, uh, heads of media houses are supposed to be part of it, among other CSOs, private sector. If you check the 15 member states, 
even if it is created, it is not functional. So are you surprised that we are in this state of lack of information, very little implementation? That is the problem. So let's use the, um, uh, the national, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, the member states as entry points. I'm appealing okay. to NSCs. Um, uh, but the last one I want to make is, in the com ECOWAS conflict prevention framework, media has a critical role, identify. But I don't think media is aware that it has that role. So I will also urge that media, you should read the ECOWAS conflict prevention framework. Mm. And it's a strategic document which shows what needs to be done, the kind of support media should get, not just from member states, but also from ECOWAS okay. that you are not aware of, to enable you to play your rightful uh, role. Because as she said, this is a partnership. Okay. Well, thanks for the eye-opener there, Ambassador. But uh, Omolora, uh, we, we're just uh, running out of it. Maybe I'll give you... Um, as the final word at this point so that uh, we, we look at the key learnings also for us if we have some little time as well bringing Lavinia as well uh, Mura, so quickly uh, let's talk about the key learnings for us um, as a country you would say yeah thank you so much I, I think before I go to that I wanted to ask you when you asked if we should expect more coup, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you do you mean democratic coup or military coup, because we have boats running up now. There are so many democratic, going, democratic coup going on uh, across many countries in the region at this moment. And some of the elements of this democratic coup, colleagues have raised it, and I also raised it in previous previous submissions. Uh, I think um, there is a, a pattern of a, a pattern or similarities that we have seen. One, one of the comments that you read talked about all this to happening in Francophone countries. Yeah. And uh, in my own view, I think there is a growing anti-French sentiment in Francophone countries. And I think leaders and ambassador, I'm happy ambassador is here, should look into that at a very strategic and, and, and you know, very high level and, and, and do something about it. Uh, and of course, some of the fundamentals that, that brought us here, the, the poverty, the inequalities, security challenges, I think others, including Ghana, Nigeria, every other country should start paying attention to it now in an inclusive manner. Okay. if they are not doing so already. Mm. So I think with that, we may not see other military calls, but okay. what do we need to do to stop the ongoing democratic calls? In terms of lessons for us, it's always interesting to listen to Ambassador Wayne whenever he talks about civil society having a platform, having opportunity to engage, you know, using the national uh, platforms, you know, starting from the national and not the regional and all of that. We have various challenges. Issues around civic space has no exclusion as far as this region is concerned. Okay. Maybe except for right. So we need to look at that. What are the what, it, it's another thing for you to give people spaces, you know, to speak. It's another thing for them to speak and for you okay. to act on it. Well, you know, in Ghana, mm -hmm. we speak Omar, a lot, um, um, but getting action. It's, 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 another it's, thing. it's another thing. Unfortunately, we, we have to wrap up at this point. I promise this discussion will definitely have it again. Uh, we've just been uh, speaking to Ambassador uh, William Awinado uh, Kanyarigi. He's a former ambassador to Nigeria, ECOWAS, and Ethiopia, and also AU, a former chief of staff of ECOWAS Commission. I also had Lavinia Diamonds, a programs director for West Africa Network Building, WANEP. Also, Mutari Mumuni Mukta, executive director of the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism. And you just heard Omolara. Uh, Balogun Head, Policy Influence and in Advocacy Unit, West Africa Civil Society Institute. We're looking at uh, the coups in the sub-region, the key learnings for us, the impact and the way forward. Many thanks uh, for your company. We'll definitely uh, do this again. I am MFR Powell and this has been The Probe. We're also, uh, there's more news when you log on to myjoyonline.com. Do have a good evening and many thanks for your company.